All right, uh, turn with me in your Bibles. Turn with me. Let's see. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> We're going to continue on in our study, things that a Christian then must be. A Christian then must be. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 3, uh, the Bible says, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. Of good behavior, of good behavior is the next topic we'll be dealing with. The things that a Christian then must be, obviously I understand that the context here is that of a bishop. It was pointed out to me though many, many years ago um, <clears throat> that these are all traits that every Christian must uphold. I think sometimes we get a, a great big beam in our eye when we start judging people that we think we should be lifted up as leadership that should have a higher expectation of what they um, ought to present, of how they ought to behave. And in many ways I do agree that those that are in leadership... Uh, those that are being looked up to by a younger generation, those that are being looked up to by younger Christians, ought to have a higher standard for themselves. But the reality is, is that the standard is set by Jesus Christ, and the standard must be met by everyone. Every Christian, every believer, then must be these things. Amen. The Christian then must be of good behavior. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, in Titus chapter 2, <clears throat> Beginning in verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to wine, teachers of good things. So we see here that they must be, the aged women, in behavior as becometh holiness. Their behavior ought to be as becometh holiness. Holiness. Don't think that the men get away from this because there's that likewise there pointing to the verse previous about the aged men. So the aged men and women ought to be in behavior as becometh holiness. Becometh, it means uh, suitable, it means fitting, it means a appropriate. Um, you, you've heard that saying, it, that's something that is unbecoming of a person. Well, that, that person is supposed to have a certain look, a certain doing a certain action, and if they're not doing what is suitable, what is fitting, what is appropriate, we will say that is unbecoming of that person. So the people in this context, the aged men and the aged women, are to show forth that behavior as becometh holiness, as someone that is, as actions that are suitable for holiness, fitting, appropriate for holiness is what's being described here. Verse 4 continues in Titus chapter 2, uh, they, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. It continues on. The purpose of them being in behavior as becometh holiness, I believe, is that so they show forth a good example, teaching good things, and that they would then teach the younger women, yes, the younger men, everyone who's following after there, everyone who is looking up to that person who is aged who is experienced, who is older in the faith, they need to have that behavior as becometh holiness. They need to be of good behavior. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, the Bible says, Philippians 1, 27, if we can get there quickly. Philippians 1, 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, and that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So the only references to of good behavior, I've already mentioned, it's that in Titus and it's that in Timothy. Behavior, though, is indicative. It points to the same term, and that's one of conversation. We have to think of conversation as just the verbal, it's just the back and forth talking. But conversation is so much more than that. Um, we, we know that your body talks. We know that your actions talk. Yes, your voice talks. 
But so much more of the conversation is actually your outward actions as a whole. And our outward actions are to be as it becometh the gospel. In other words, as it becometh the full and whole revelation of Jesus Christ, the written word of God, uh, the embodied word of God, the living word of God, as it becometh what he in, is encapsulated by, what he is, is of a whole. As it becometh that, our conversation ought to follow. We're to do it then in one spirit, in one mind, and we're to strive together. Notice in that text it says, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. And then it says, that I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast. So it's talking about many. So the joy of the King James Bible is that when it uses ye, you, your, it's talking about a plurality. And when it uses thee, thou, thine, it's talking about a singular. And so we see here, Paul is talking to many, and then he says this, that ye stand fast in one spirit, and in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This good behavior then, this good conversation as it becometh the gospel, as it becometh the faith of the gospel, is a conversation that is many acting as one. In other words, people should be able to look at a Christian believer and it should be typified by what this good behavior is. There ought to be one spirit over us. There ought to be one mind working together for the faith of the gospel. And this is what happens when we're together. Being normal, I believe, being um, of good conversation, being of good behavior comes when we are together. The, uh, the great equalizer in the, in the movement of Christians is the church. The great balance that we have is the church. It is the pillar and ground of the truth. And if we are not partaking in that fellowship, we have every tendency to go off in ye, you, your own ways. Your own thoughts, your own mind, your own behaviors then, because they're now unequalized. They're unstandardized. They're ununified um, in Christ in the church. I believe that when we come together, it allows for us to essentially have that balance, have that equalization. If somebody starts to slip off and have a different behavior, it'll be very noticeable, and the people that are in the church will be able to draw that person back unto them. It's unity, it's togetherness, it's oneness within the body of Christ, within the believers striving together under that one spirit that gives us that good behavior as a standard. And we can help one another along in this. As the behavior of the elder women was to be taught to the others that follow, the younger, so the conversation as it becometh the gospel is best exhibited through the body. The body working together then teaches one another in this good behavior. And if we don't have the church as a whole to strive together in this manner, then, then, then we're at a loss. Anything can happen when people are out and left to their own devices. So much the more so, if you look back in uh, verse 6 of the same chapter, it says, being confident, or uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So then we see that, yes, the striving together is in the body, but the body is Christ. We are to strive within that context of being one in Christ, recognizing then that is Christ which hath begun the good work in us, and who will also do it. It's his work. we got to give him the glory again. So Amen. our good behavior is because we are in Christ and follow after him. Our good behavior is because we are within the body of Christ as we assemble together as a church and we do what's being taught to us by the elders, that they learned from the elders, that they learned from the elders, that we all learned and partake of because of Christ, because of the written word of God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we see then that fellowship helps this good behavior come to fruition. It helps us by, first we learn it when we are in fellowship. And if anyone remembers when they were a brand new Christian, the first time you kind of snuck into a church and you felt out of place and you didn't wonder what you were doing, if you were a man, you were probably like, oh man, everyone's wearing a tie here. Maybe the next time you came in, you, you had a tie on and it was just, 
your behavior changed because of the people around you. If you went in and you looked all rough and tumble or your talk was different, you know, very quickly you saw that people act and behave differently and the cleansing agent of the church was that they were unified under the same belief, minding of the same things, following the same Lord, and thereby when somebody new comes in, they are conformed to that same behavior because it's just natural that people start to dwell and blend within their own surroundings as they learn, not necessarily just through um, being instructed, but just by seeing. I remember it wasn't long when I stepped into my, a Baptist church for the first time that I put a tie on simply because I saw the other men with ties on. It was just natural. I dressed up in my Sunday best simply because I saw everyone else dressing up in their Sunday best. I started to talk differently just because... Uh, everyone else around me was talking differently. So the fellowship does help our behavior, helps us to mature and be right in the Lord by learning it first and foremost, but also by the encouragement in it. The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 14, the wicked slay such as be of an upright conversation. Okay, look at Psalm 37, if you will. Psalm 37. <clears throat> Psalm 37, and in verse 14. Psalm 37, and verse 14. The wicked have drawn out their sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of an upright conversation. So no doubt we see here that those that are of the upright conversation are being put down by the wicked. They're being slew by the wicked. They're being destroyed by the wicked. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> They bent their bows even. They're ready to cast down the poor and needy. They're ready to slay those that are of an upright conversation. Those that are of good behavior. Now if you're left to your own, if you're not a part of the fellowship, where's the encouragement when such things happen to you? Look to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We need to be a member of a body because we need to be encouraged when the wicked bend their bow. We need to be encouraged when those attack us for being in an upright conversation. When you're around more people that have that same upright conversation, it encourages you. It helps you. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 3, and verse 15, the Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that she suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So we're to have a good conscience as we go about doing good behavior. But the Bible is clear that there are going to be those that speak falsely of you. There are going to be those that go about speaking evil as of evildoers, as if they were evildoers. So the suggestion here, I believe, is that they could be even from among you, or at least from your family members, or at least from those that, that you know personally. But the Bible is saying here that, hey, there's going to be people, be people that attack your good conversation in Christ. And yes, it is better that you would be attacked for doing well. But it doesn't always feel good. It doesn't always feel better. It doesn't always lead to you wanting to do more good, unless you're with the body, unless you're with believers, unless that good behavior is being encouraged through the preaching, is being encouraged through the fellowship, is being encouraged through, through the, the right hand of fellowship being extended to you then suddenly it's easier to continue in that good behavior. Your conscience clear, you can now continue to work the works that Christ wants you to do. Now we will always be attacked, we will always be ridiculed, but like I said, it is always good to be attacked for well-doing, and it is always better when somebody else is encouraging you in the well that you are doing. 1 Peter chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 12, it says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So our good works, our good behavior, our good conversation is to be witnessed by the world. The purpose is that we would, of, of having good behavior, of having good conscience, is in order that the world would see it, and then it says here, would glorify God the Father in the day of visitation. Visitation. That's the purpose of our good works. There's no reason why we do good works is yes to be seen by others. Not, not to self-glorify, not to lift myself up, but that the world would see the change in you. That the world would see the righteousness that you exhibit through Christ. And thereby, their own consciences would be convicted of it. 
Look at verse 15. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. I believe that the best defense in this situation is a good offense. Your good behavior, your good works will speak for themselves. And even though people will attack you for it, even though people will try to put you down for it, even though the wicked will try to destroy you because you're of good behavior, the good behavior is what you lead with. It's what's visible. It's what's known of you. It's what becometh you. And hey, if you're in the fellowship of the believers, there's nothing that's going to put you down. So we see here that the Christian then must be of good behavior. There's many exhortations to maintain good works before men to be of a good um, a good faith, a good witness, uh, to be one that is seen as of doing good works. And even though you'll get put down for it, hey, glory to God, the, the believers are here to lift you up and to help you through those situations. Amen. Amen. A Christian then must be given to hospitality. Titus chapter 1. A Christian then must be given to hospitality. Titus chapter 1, sorry, turn to Romans chapter 12 if you would. Titus chapter 1 says the term given to hospitality, it renders it as lover of hospitality. So we are to love hospitality. Given to it simply means to submit thyself wholly unto it. So, to, so remember, you know, somebody in the Bible that is given to wine, it, it's consumed them, it's taken them over. They're a drunkard, they're a, a filthy person, it's bringing them down, it's controlling them, it's, it's manipulating their every action, it's the focus of every desire. The lover of hospitality, the one that's given to hospitality, is the same thing. They desire to seek, they desire to do, they desire to be. It becomes who they are. They are friendly, they are generous. Uh, their reception is that way. Their entertainment of guests and of visitors or of strangers is one that is friendly, is one that is generous. Romans chapter 12, and I'll get there, Romans chapter 12, describes then that same concept, the idea of being given to hospitality. Look in Romans chapter 12 and in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one toward another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estates. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. This is a must be for everybody. I don't know of anything in this list that wouldn't apply to any Christians. And they all point back to the original context of the chapter where it says, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the perfect will of God is proven. The good and acceptable will of God is proven when you're renewed in your mind, when you're not conformed to this world, when you're a living sacrifice unto God, doing your reasonable service unto Him. And this is for brethren. This is for sisters. This is for the believers to take heed to. This list applies then to all People. And then we see here that if these are sacrificial actions, if these are the outflowing of a spirit that has offered itself as a living sacrifice, a man that has given himself, a woman that has given themselves unto God in order to do his will, we see then that hospitality too is one of these sacrifices. And we all know that hospitality can be a sacrifice. If you've ever hosted a large amount of people, if you've ever brought people into your house, Quite often people set up a safe space within their home. That's their home. They like things where they are. They, they do things the way they do. And it's all contained within their own being. But to open that up makes you vulnerable. Open it up allows people into your space 
which isn't the easiest thing for us. But the Christian must be given to that. Their desire must be to open their house. Their desire must be to be a blessing to people in that way. How else is it a sacrifice? Well, it's a sacrifice because your finances are now are now given. When you welcome someone to your home, you're giving of your finances in order to care for them. Um, how else? Um, you're, you're now exhibiting selflessness. You're caring for others. So your care for others, your giving of yourself, your giving of your finances, your giving of your personal space, your opening yourself in vulnerableness, um, is all a sacrifice unto God. Being hospitable then is something that I believe we ought to be given to. Every Christian then must be given to hospitality. But look, the rewards follow. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2, the, the Bible says, Be not afraid to entertain strangers, whereby some have, have entertained angels unawares. And I'm, I'm maybe, uh, maybe butchering that, Hebrews 13, verse 2. I'll read it clearly. It says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. And how true is that? Well, we don't know because it's unawares. But we may have in our past and, uh, and in days to come, we may have individually entertained angels unawares. And what would the testimony be of how you dealt with that that angel? How would the testimony be when he reports back to God or whatever capacity that works out? Um, we, we don't know. It's, it's unawares. It's something that we don't know. But the care of the Christian is that they would be ready to entertain should an angel of God themselves come into our presence and we get the opportunity to minister to them, to care for them, to show hospitality unto them. The good example then is Genesis 18. In Genesis 18 we have Abraham. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mary. So notice it's the Lord that appears. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked and lo three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So he offers himself immediately as a servant unto his Lord. He said, Lord, if I have found favor, if you favor me, if you, if you look uh, generously, if you look good upon me, if, if you lift me up as, 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 uh, as someone who is lowly in thy sight... Pass not away. And he says this in verse 4. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched. And wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. He offers the Lord simply a little bit of water, perhaps to drink and quench his thirst. Puts a little bit of water down. Washes the Lord's feet with it and allows the Lord then to rest under the tree. Get a little bit of shade. But then it continues further in his act of hospitality. He says, and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. That after that ye shall pass on. So he's now going to give them a morsel. And he says, For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. Um, graciously receiving of Abraham's hospitality here. Abraham then hastened unto the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto the young man and hastened to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. The great act of hospitality of Abraham goes so far as that he hastened. He gets to Sarah, and he says, Sarah, we need to get ready and, and prepare a meal for these men that appeared unto me today. We need to get the uh, fat calf. We need to get a tender and good one. Perhaps that means a young calf. Butter and milk. Spare not. We're going to bring them. Um, yes, in to have a little bit of water. Yes, in to wash their feet. Yes, to rest in the cool of the day um, when, it's, when it's hot, to find shade. And then he says, we're going to feed them. We're going to feed them well. And then, only then, they'll be sent on their way. That's an example of good hospitality. And in contrast, his nephew Lot, look in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1. And there came two angels, so he has less angels here to deal with, um, to Sodom at even. Um, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So he does show reverence here. He does, he does come to them and meet them at the gate and bow himself. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house. And tarry all night, and wash your feet. Great, he offers them to wash their feet. And you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, 
Neighbor, we will abide in the street all night. I don't know what it was that they would desire the street more than to go and wash their feet at Lot's house. Perhaps it was run like a bachelor's pad or something. I, I don't know what it is. But nevertheless, they said, Neighbor, we will abide here. I think these same angels would have been more than happy to stay with Abraham with the care and treatment that they were getting, with the hospitality they were getting there. And verse 3 says, He pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. So in contrast to the great feast of a, of a, of a fatted and tender calf, um, Lot here offers them uh, the equivalent of um, some saltine crackers. They have uh, baked unleavened bread, and he offers it to them. He is showing hospitality, but he's not, he's not showing it as greatly. He doesn't even have his wife here to support him in the showing of the hospitality. It's not as great as an example. And so you can see very quickly that there's, there's two different contrasts to the example of hospitality. Uh, sometimes you may in your life entertain angels unawares. Do you want to be an Abraham or do you want to be a Lot? You need to be given, Christian, to hospitality. Be hospitable. God is. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 2. Our God is hospitable. Ephesians chapter 2 shows this. He commands it so you know that it would be a character trait of him. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says in Ephesians 2 and verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Look at this. The Lord is hospitable. He takes those that were strangers. He takes those that were foreigners. And he makes us fellow citizens. And then he invites us into the household of God. He invites us into his home. Into his abode. He brings us in. And God has such good care for us. I mean, none of us can just... We can only think and speak of the, the limitless things that God does provide for us. So much more than just a fatted calf. So much more than saltine crackers. God provides us everything, even the breath within our own lungs, with, within our own veins, the blood that courses through it. The Lord God welcomes us who are saved to not be strangers anymore, not be foreigners, but now we're fellow citizens. He is hospitable. He opens up the doors of the household of God. And allows us in. In Deuteronomy, the Bible says, Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers. So because we were strangers at one point, it is our job to love the strangers. Who, who quite often is the Bible describing when it refers to strangers? Well, it's the Gentiles, who in time past are Gentiles. Even Ephesians chapter 2 goes on that same vein in that same context. He says, ye were Gentiles carried about with your, with your lusts and your sins and all these sorts of things. But now he says, you are being welcomed into the commonwealth. Though you were aliens, though you were strangers, though you were foreigners, come into Israel. Come into the covenants. Come into the promise. God's being hospitable to us. Because we are strangers, we ought to love other people in the same way. Reach out to the Gentiles. Amen. Reach out to those that are without, those who are not saved, those who are not a part of Israel, those who are strangers to the covenants, have no idea that God provided them hope, that God provided them salvation, that God provided them his own household for them to enter into and to behold. God wants us to entertain strangers in that same way. God wants us to open up ourselves in hospitality. Next thing we see is that a Christian then must be apt to teach. A Christian then must be apt to teach. Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you would. Deuteronomy 6. Fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy 6. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and in verse 3, Deuteronomy 6, verse 3, it says, Hear therefore, O Israel, observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. We are commanded then to teach diligently, always. We are to be those 
leaders to our children, and by extension, leaders to the children in the faith, leaders to the children um, in Christ, leaders to, again, even the unbelievers. We are to teach, I believe, diligently unto our children, yes. But hey, if you're sitting in thine house, when you're walking by the way, when you're lying down, when you're rising up, that's an all the time. So you're not all the time with your family, but there's to be a constant teaching of the law of God, a constantly outflowing of the law of God, whether it be by word or by deed. I believe that it's the Christian's responsibility to teach others. A Christian then must be apt to teach. So where does the aptitude come from? Well, it comes from doing it time and time and time and time and time again. The first time you do anything, you're probably no good at it. But after you've done it a few times, after you've been more experienced, after you've learned, and the application is this. When you do teaching, when you teach others of God, it becomes easier and easier every time. The first time you ever go out soul winning as a silent partner, um, you're, not, you're not welcoming, you're not inviting, you're not ready, you're not waiting for the opportunity to say something edifying or to teach somebody about the Bible. In fact, you're probably just, just sitting back nervously trying to just, just get past that next door. I don't know if you've ever been there and you've knocked and you've been like... Oh, I hope no one's home. <laughs> Sometimes the first door is like that. I don't know why. You go out soul winning and you're just like, man, I hope no one's home. I, I don't know what it is. It's just it's just that first door. But then you get there and you start you start working with people. You start talking with people. But even within the context of an hour or two hours or three hours or however long you're out witnessing to people, your aptitude to teach grows. Yep. The first person you might stumble and fumble and mess up. And hey, don't don't get discouraged because I mess up giving the gospel to people all the time. I don't know how many times I've been like, blah, 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 and it just sounds so awkward. I'm like, anyways, have a nice day. Close the door, walk away going, what in the world did I just say? It, it, it happens. I mean, we're, we're human, right? We try the best to have tact. I try the best to have, have a right reason to say or a good presentation or a good introduction for that matter, but we mess up. But the reality is, and I've experienced that, is that as the first hour maybe goes by, or the, the first five doors, or six doors, or seven doors, gradually you're interacting with people. It just becomes you. It becomes, you become apt to teach. You become more fluent with your presentation. You become stronger in your, in your conviction. You become more powerful in the Word of God. And, that, and that's something that will grow, you know, this day, and to this day, and to this day. And as our lives go on, we become more apt to teach as we practice teaching. Turn to Psalm chapter 78. Psalm 78. Psalm 78 brings in the same idea of teaching children. And it's our responsibility, I believe. Those that are younger, those that are babes in Christ, those that are younger spiritually and physically, it is our responsibility to teach them. We are to be apt to teach. Be better at teaching tomorrow than you are today. Psalm chapter 78, verse 1 says, Give ear, O my people, unto my law. Incline your ears unto the words of my mouth. So if you're not inclining your ears to the words of God, how will you ever be able to teach them? God here promises, he says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and have known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, and that, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who shall arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. So we see a reset button here. We see, we see a, a new generation rising up where God is calling unto them. And he says, incline your ear unto the words of my mouth. He says he's going to open his mouth. There's going to be dark sayings. Yes, but they've heard it. It's been made known unto them by their fathers. But now the difference is, is that though they had heard of it and though they have known of it, this generation says, hey, we will not hide it from our children. We're going to show the generation to come the praises. We're going to show the generation to come the mighty works of God. And the purpose of that is that the generation to come might know them, meaning the testimonies, and they might be able to declare them unto their children. This is how aptitude to teach comes. It comes from generational teaching. 
comes from teaching the children who teach the children who teach the children who teach the children. Our responsibility then is to take what's been given to us by our fathers, and many of us are first generation Christians, sadly to say, we're to then start afresh and say, hey, God established this testimony. God established this law. And if our fathers made known it unto us, we will pass it on. But if not, hey, we are going to give heed. We are going to incline our ear. We are going to hear the word of God and pass it on to our children. We're going to train our children to pass it on to their children. And their children will pass it on to their children. That we don't be as the fathers who were stubborn and rebellious. Instead, we would be steadfast with God. Instead, our heart would be aright with God. And our spirit moved only by the living God. So this also continues into our gospel ministry. Not just teaching children, not just teaching our children, not all of us have children, but all of us do have responsibility towards other people's children. Um, cousins, nephews, brothers, sisters, um, in Christ and out of Christ. Um, you know, we have the responsibility as elders to teach the youngers, whether by word or by conversation indeed. Matthew chapter 28, though, extends this into our gospel ministry. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And again, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The gospel ministry is one of teaching all nations. It is also one of, yes, baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Holy Ghost. But then it continues on with teaching them to observe all things whatsoever. So there's a gospel preaching, which is teaching in and of itself, and every Christian ought to be, every Christian must be apt to teach in the gospel. Also, they should teach to observe all things whatsoever are commanded in the word of God. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 talks about the same thing, about, about teaching every man. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 says, To whom God would make known what the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is, in Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We're all too, I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. The work that the Apostle Paul is talking about, the mighty work that is flowing out of him, that God's working in him, is the teaching in all wisdom. It is the warning in all wisdom of men. His responsibility in the gospel ministry then is to teach every man, warn every man, why? That he could present every man perfect before God one day. But the gospel ministry, I believe, the gospel ministry then starts... It starts with mom. It starts with dad. It starts with elder Christian. It starts with the elder ladies. It starts with the elder fathers. It starts with those that are known and grown up in the word of God. It's their responsibility to then teach the younger generation. That's where the gospel ministry really believes. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy had a great start, and, as a, and with a great start came, came great blessings in the end, and he was able to um, know the holy scriptures from a child, but they were able to make him wise unto salvation. And then this statement is made, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So Paul here does compliment Timothy, and he says, Continue in the things which thou hast learned, and the things which thou hast known, and knowing whom thou hast learned them from. And he says, You have known these things from a child, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Then he says this, hey, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable doctrine for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And he says that the man of God may be perfect. Hey, you're not perfect yet. Therefore, you need to continue to ap have aptitude. You need to continue to grow. You need to continue to learn more from the scriptures that you would be able to pass on to the generation to follow what you have received. 
Hey, from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, but if it ends there, the chain is broken and we fall back into contempt with God. We fall back into struggling and into, and into sin and into rebellion. But if Timothy is to continue in the things which he has learned, knowing of certainly that he learned them from Christ himself, he's able to grow and use what he has learned to grow further in helping others, further in supporting others, further in teaching the generation to come the things that he has learned. He ought to be apt to teach them. The Christian then must be of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your word given to us in due time. I pray, God, that you would just encourage and strengthen our hearts, Lord, uh, as the service continues, and help us to bring glory to your name. Amen.